I'd like to thank my Patreon subscribers for their support, and so I'm going to make a batch of these iron-on transfer logos that you can apply to your own lab coat. At the end of July 2015, everyone who's subscribed at the $3 per video level or higher and has entered their mailing address will receive one of these logos. Head over to Patreon to see more details about this. Thanks very much, I really appreciate it. Also on my Twitter feed you may have seen that I took some scanning electron micrographs of a CD, a DVD, and a Blu-ray disc. And I'll put the high resolution images on my blog as well and put a link in the description. As you can see the bit density is quite a bit higher on Blu-ray and the, the jump or the difference between uh, Blu-ray and DVD is actually quite a bit higher than DVD and CD. The first tool that I'd like to talk about is this digital angle gauge. And as you can see, it's just a box with a digital readout and some magnets on the bottom. And the idea is that you stick it down to a table saw surface and zero it, and then stick it to the blade, and you can even push it down so that it's square to the table, and then it will read off the angle that the blade is currently at. So this is way more accurate than the bevel gauge that's on the table saw, and it reads off in tenths of a degree, which is uh, super useful because um, for, for doing boxes and those things that require very tight miter angles, you can really dial it in and get it accurate. It also works really well on band saws, on jointer setups, and even on glue ups where you um, have a little bit of flexibility in your jig and you want to make sure that your glue up is right at 90. Pipe threads are sort of a barbaric way to make a seal, but it is cheap and easy and it does work uh, with one problem. In a standard pipe thread joint, when you screw this together, there will actually be a spiral leak path that goes around because the two surfaces don't touch each other. The, the pipe and the fitting don't actually touch 100% all along the pipe fitting. So these are actually designed to be used with a sealing compound. And the job of that compound is to take up that last little gap between the pipe and the fitting and prevent the gas or liquid from taking that spiral path through the thread gap out to the outside. So one good brand of pipe seal compound is Rector Seal. This is good stuff. McMaster also sells uh, compounds that are specifically made for plastic to plastic pipe joints. Also, you may have seen or used uh, Teflon tape, and a lot of people will claim that this actually isn't even designed for sealing pipe. However, it does work pretty well, and there's something else you should be aware of. If you buy uh, standard Teflon tape at your local hardware store, you're likely getting a fairly cheap grade of it, a fairly low density of Teflon. However, if you buy this from McMaster, for example, they sell it in commercial grade, a standard military grade, and a premium military grade. And no, this actually isn't an $800 toilet seat. This is actually worthwhile. The higher the grade, the higher the density of the Teflon. So this premium military grade stuff is a little bit thicker, but it's actually much more dense. And so if you've worked with this tape before, the denser stuff, one, is just easier to handle. It doesn't stick to things quite as ridiculously. And also if you're doing uh, large diameter pipe sealing, I find that the premium grade works a whole lot better. You don't need to use as many turns and hence you get a better seal. Also be aware that there's a different kind of pipe thread out there that is designed not to be used with compound. It's called dry seal or NPTF, which is National Pipe Thread Fuel. And the difference is that the uh, major and minor diameters of this thread are slightly different than standard NPT so that when you screw them together there's actually an interference fit so that the pipe threads will actually cut into the fitting slightly and eliminate that spiral gap. Um, the trouble is that if you uh, put it together and take it apart once or twice uh, you may not get that good seal anymore because the interference fit has already been done once and then when you take it apart and put it back together you may not get that. So I've had limited experience trying dry seal without sealant. I usually find it's better just to go with standard NPT and then use a sealant of some kind. You may not be aware, but hot glue actually comes in colors other than translucent. And so black is actually a really useful color to have in the shop as well. Um, on a side note, I don't recommend this brand of hot glue gun. There is a Sure Bonder on Amazon that seems the best. I've also tried the $75 model on McMaster and actually prefer the Sure Bonder. And so as usual, I'll put links to all this stuff in the description. Uh, one example of a use for black hot glue is if you're doing a project that involves LEDs coming through a panel like this, and you don't want optical crosstalk between neighboring LEDs, you can use some black hot glue on the back side and cover that thing up with something that's optically opaque so that you don't get crosstalk. 
Also, if you're doing any sort of optics project and you want to seal the box up, this makes a really good light tight seal for the box. This is magnetic viewer film that made an appearance in one of my other videos. It's kind of more of a toy than a tool, but it does have some cool uses. This is a magnet from a speaker that looks like it might be um, sort of uniformly axially magnetized. But when we put the magnetic viewer film on it, you can see that it's actually got uh, sections in it. It's kind of neat. Also, if you've gotten one of these cheap sort of printed magnets, this is like a flexible rubberized magnet that came in the mail. Uh, you might also think this is very simple, but check out what happens under the viewer film. You can see that it actually has alternating poles, north-south, north-south, in a very rapid sort of pattern. And I've heard a few conflicting uh, theories as to why these are built this way. One is that the, the fields sort of cancel out the farther away you get from the magnet. So since they don't want this, you know, demagnetizing credit cards and affecting, you know, the mail and all kinds of stuff, if they put north-south poles here, it kind of, you know, cancels out, so the field dies off very quickly. Um, another theory is that with the north-south poles so close together, if you put this on a steel object, you'll actually get more adhesion, more magnetic pull force, because the magnetic circuit is shorter, because it's, you know, it's a short path from north to south. I think I'll talk more about this in a future magnetics video. Another cool use with the film is to sort of spy on electronics, and so this is my cell phone, and you can kind of see by waving the film around that there's something magnetic going on in the phone. And, um, you know, it's not exactly a surprise what it is. I mean, there's, you know, speakers. There's a speaker there, and then at the top is probably the handset speaker. And I think that's pretty much all this phone has. You should try it on newer cell phones that have more gizmos than this. If you need to make a bunch of twisted wiring harnesses, a way to save time is to use a drill to do the twisting. So I've just got these three equal length pieces of wire in the vise and then chucked up in the drill. And then all you have to do is just apply a little tension and let her rip. You may find yourself in a situation where you need to know which side of the line is hot and which side is neutral. In this case, the plug is polarized, but you may suspect it's wrong, or you might be working on an older house that doesn't have polarized plugs, or even a new house that just doesn't even have plugs installed yet. So here's a quick trick to figure this out. Just with a standard neon tester, if you touch one side of the tester with your fingers, and then put the other side into the socket, you can see there we didn't get a light. But if we move over to this side, you can see the as I put it in and take it out, you can see it flashing a bit there. So what's happening is your body is acting as a large capacitor and you're actually getting a tiny amount of current to flow uh, through the neon tester. Now remember that there's a current limiting resistor in this, so don't do this with just a plain neon bulb or you'll get a really good, you'll know which side of the line is hot basically if you do it that way. And of course for the safety conscious, uh, there do exist these testers where you can just plug this in and it will diagnose all the possible problems. And so reversed hot neutral, open ground, on and on. I've always had trouble cutting large diameter tubing like this. This is just soft nylon tubing. And it doesn't really work very well with scissors like this. Um, I've actually broken pairs of scissors by leaning on them too hard to cut this. And also, like heavier duty snips don't really do a great job because they aren't sharp enough. And so the tubing just sort of folds over and it doesn't cut very well. And then finally, you can try sort of hacking away at it with a knife like this, but for large diameters, this doesn't work, and you'll, you'll end up with a nasty edge. So I recently found a tool on McMaster that really works super well for this. This is basically um, a very long razor blade that comes down on a plastic anvil like this, and it's basically perfectly suited for cutting uh, soft tubing. And so the amount of control that you have in a cut like this is really nice. It leaves a super clean edge, takes very little force to cut, and you can even just get the length exactly the way you need it. Really quite sweet. My dad recently gave me this switch contact burnisher, and I've used this quite a bit in refurbishing the scanning electron microscope. And so the idea is that if you're cleaning a, an old relay or, or a switch, uh, it's a bad idea to use sandpaper on there because it ruins the coating on the switch or relay contacts. So what you really want to do is use something like this burnisher, which has just the ever slightest amount of abrasive quality. I think it's more like a, a knife iron that just sort of pushes the metal around and then follow it up with some contact cleaner. I like Deoxit brand, but this is, oh, I think, almost about the same stuff. 
You've probably noticed that most cordless drill chucks won't close down on very small drill bits. So I actually had to do quite a bit of searching, but I finally found uh, basically a pin vise that is small enough and easy enough to use and also clamps down to zero so that you can grip really tiny drill bits with it. Okay, see you next time. Bye.